Welcome to Hope at Night, featuring Rico Hill, Hannah Kaliova, Q&A with our live audience, and host, Anil Kanda. Today's episode, What is the Best Diet? And here's your host, Anil Kanda. Welcome to Hope at Night. Whether you're a couch connoisseur or a kale connoisseur, you're probably at least vaguely aware that health is a life-changing topic. In America, chronic diseases such as heart disease, stroke, and diabetes are some of the leading causes of death. But it doesn't have to be that way. These are largely preventable through lifestyle choices, meaning that for many Americans, they are literally digging their graves with their forks, minus the exercise. Does the Bible have any wisdom to share when it comes to health? Is there a particular diet it promotes, whether a meat diet or a plant-based diet? Does God even care about our health? We have with us two great guests to help us answer that question a medical doctor, and a former entertainment executive turned health lecturer. Let's welcome our first guest to Hope at Night, Rico Hill. Woo, Rico, glad you're here, brother. Wow, look at all these healthy looking people. <laughs> Rico, you were involved in the entertainment industry. Were you always a Christian passionate about health? No, I wasn't. Actually, when I was in, uh, in the entertainment industry, that's when my sort of conversion took place. I became very, very concerned about my health, my family's health, and I just started to study my way into it. Okay, what was your journey as you began to study out this topic of health, and why was it so life-changing for you? Well, my mother was, she had had triple bypass heart surgery. Wow. That was pretty significant. Yeah. And I started asking the question, what was it that caused her to have that surgery that, I mean, it's so traumatic in and of itself, and she was on like 18 different medications. Wow. So I was like, what can I do to help? And all things led to a plant-based diet. She went from 18 down to just two prescription drugs. So I said, there's something to this. Wow, how old was she? She was 65 years old at the time. So even at the age of 65, there can be a rebound to health. Look, or the data show, that if you make changes, you can actually, if you're 70, 80, you can feel like you're 40. Wow, wow. Or 30. Uh, does the Bible talk about health? Does it contain any principles for health, or is it just about theology? No, it's, it's not just about theology. The Bible is a book of principles, right? Mm. It's all about the principles of, of life and living life. And certainly, one of the great equalizer is health. Everybody wants it. I have not found anyone who said, please, no thank you, I don't want health. Everybody wants health, right? Right. So the Bible would have to have something to say about health. Because it impacts every area of our life. Look, they say that a person will, will spend all of his time and resources to gain wealth. Mm. But then when he loses his health, he'll use everything he's got to get, it, to get it back. Right, we all know what that's like when we're sick and we're stuck in bed. Uh, I don't like that. <laughs> I like to be on the move. Right. What kind of principles are contained in the scripture about health? I had done this plant-based summit. It was in New York, and they brought a lot of people there to, to just hear about what it's like to, with this movement, because it's a movement around the globe, people are turning plant-based, right? So they wanted to know, is there anything in the Bible that speaks of this? And you had all types of people from all walks of life who came to that plant-based summit. And what they asked me to do was to talk about it from a, a biblical perspective. In fact, the topic was, what does the Bible say about health? And all you have to do is go to the first three chapters of Genesis, the book of Genesis, Genesis being the book of beginnings. And in that book, it talks about what we should eat, how much sunshine we should get, what we should drink, uh, exercise, everything is contained there by way of principle and the stories that are therein. So when you go back to the book of Genesis, you find this optimal way of living. It's all right there, including 
a plant-based diet. Could you hone in on one of these other lifestyle principles that make such a significant impact in our life? Obviously, I think you mentioned in, in your opening monologue, you talked about exercise. Exercise is critical for us. And we find that there was, there was a man in the beginning, his name was Adam. And Adam was given exercise in the garden, believe it or not. After he's created, as the narrative tells us, that God said, look, you're to tend and keep the garden. Now, what does that mean exactly? I mean, it was a perfect paradise, right? But at the same time here, this perfect man still needed to be doing his squats. <laughs> <laughs> so he had to actually go and pick flowers, pick this, different types of produce or whatever. And we find now that stretching is so important. Sometimes people are doing aerobic exercise, anaerobic exercise, you know, things that are calisthenics, whatever it is, you know, but often what we've missed in the last few years is the importance of just stretching, stretching right. your muscles. And that's what was established in the beginning. You know, y you were part of the entertainment industry and there's a lifestyle, a fast paced lifestyle that's connected to the entertainment industry. How did that come into conflict with now uh, your just sort of the, your new lifestyle that's embracing these principles of health and as changes are taking place? You know, I don't think it's any different from my, my entertainment experience or even my experience now as a producer uh, or as a health lecturer. I'm traveling all the time. I'm, I'm on planes, I'm off of planes. You know, I'm going through airports where you can't find anything good to eat. With this fast-paced lifestyle, you know, you have to plan. You have mm. to plan. You have to be intentional. So when I travel, that's the main thing. That's my biggest challenge, is making sure that I've made provisions for me to eat wow. in a way that is going to be healthy for me. So I take stuff with me. Uh, the Bible talks about diets. There are different kinds of diets. When someone says, hey, I'm, I'm now following the Bible diet, the biblical diet, but the Bible tells us about different kinds of diets. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the different kinds of diets? I talked about it quite a bit at the plant-based summit because again, people were sort of like in the dark. They thought this plant-based thing had just started, right? right? But in Genesis, in the very first chapter, the original diet, it was fruit, nuts, grains, and seeds. Mm. Vegetables didn't come until later, right? right? So, and it came after this very, very bad mistake took place there in this paradise. But fruits, nuts, grains, and seeds was the, were the original diet. And we find that when you eat, and uh, I think your next guest can really elaborate on this because she's done amazing research on it, but we find that when we eat just a handful of nuts, no salt, no honey or caramelized, just raw nuts. I'm talking about almonds and I'm talking about uh, walnuts and all these kind of things, cashews. Um, you f we find that by just eating a handful of those each day extends your life by two and a half years. So you're telling me just if I take a handful of almonds a day that my, that my longevity will increase? Here's the thing. It's a fat, it's a good fat, but it's a fat nonetheless. Okay. So you want to make sure that you don't overdo it. It's all about temperance, which is another principle that we find in the book of Genesis. Right. You know, we need to make sure that we are temperate in all things. You know, you so, can have something that's really, really good, right. but you can do way too much of it. Right. right, so just because it's good and just because it's healthy doesn't mean that I can eat all of it all day long, nonstop, right? Exactly. Again, I like to come from looking at the Bible, and if the Bible says it, and then I can go to science and find the same thing, like with the diet, right? Uh, the original diet, fruits, nuts, grains, and seeds, everyone that is anybody, all peer-reviewed studies show that this is the optimal diet, right. to eat living food, right? And when we do that, what does it do? It extends our lives, right? The second diet was after the fall of man, when sin came in, right? <laughs> and then what was instituted in the diet, what was placed on the menu was vegetables. And we find that all the science says, a Harvard University study says, of all the things that we could eat, greens packed the greatest punch. That's a direct quote from that study. So this was instituted as a second part of the diet. We find that, like kale, you mentioned that. Right, right. Collards, right. all your green vegetables actually are wonderful cancer fighters, right? <laughs> so there was a strategy to this, not something that was just arbitrary, right? And then the third diet we call the emergency diet. 
all vegetation and fruits and everything was destroyed and therefore God said you can now eat meat. Right, so right? it was being permitted now it was to permitted. eat meat. It okay. wasn't his perfect plan, but it was a permissive kind of thing. You have permission to do it, it won't be the best, but it will be something that you'll need to do under these emergency situations. Is there a timing to when eating is most optimal for us? Well, you wanna get up in the morning and have breakfast. Some people like to say, well, you know what? I like to skip breakfast. I don't like breakfast. If you don't have breakfast at the time that, you know, because everything is based on the circadian rhythm, day and night cycle, light and dark. And when the sun comes up, your body's like, all right, it's time to break fast. So you want to actually eat in the morning a nice big breakfast. Here's what we say. Eat breakfast like a king or queen. Eat lunch like a prince or princess. And dinner like a pauper, a poor person. In other words, that means have a nice big breakfast, have a, you know, a modest sized lunch, and at night, don't eat a lot of food. Because why? Sun is setting, you're going to bed, and you don't want to overtax your system. Your body is preparing for rejuvenation during the and night. And healing and detoxing. Your body does all those things. Wonderful science has come out now about when are the best times for us to eat. Now, is that a principle in the Bible? Absolutely. When they were in the desert, it was a time when they were in the desert, you know. Um, in the book of Exodus, they had come out of Egypt there in the desert and God has to feed them because they have no food, right? He has to give them water, right? So he brings down, according to the narrative there in Exodus, something from heaven, they call it manna, mm -hmm. right? And it came early in the morning and they had to go gather it and they would eat it in the morning. So God knows when to feed us. <laughs> and then it would be a second time that he would feed them in the afternoon. But Get this, this is really amazing. He only fed them two times a day. Only two times a day. Yeah, you know what I ask people in my lectures? I say, like I'll ask you, uh, how many of you eat three meals a day? How many of you eat two meals a day? How many of you eat one meal a day all day long? <laughs> this is not the best way to do it. This is not God's plan. You eat in the morning, you let your system rest, and then you have another meal at a designated time. And then as the sun is setting, then you want to start to prepare the body for rejuvenation. Yeah, it seems the digestive system is really the power plant of the entire system. And when the digestive system is overtaxed, there begins to be a sort of a negative impact upon the rest of the body. Absolutely, you know I tell people, you know, your, your stomach and your digestion is the most powerful, most energy expending, Thing that your body does. Mm. It is a violent process with <laughs> digestive juices and all this churning and all this kind of stuff and we take it for granted but it's it requires a lot of energy so a lot of times when you go and you're like I'm trying to lose weight and I'm gonna go and get a trainer they'll tell you you know what you're gonna do here's what you're gonna do you're gonna eat five meals a day right, right? <laughs> five meals a day and not realizing that will help you lose weight but it will overtax your system, like you said. You know, there's a lot of bodybuilders that subscribe to this idea of eating every two or three hours, but the average lifespan on bodybuilders is 40 to 50 years old. These guys that are complete, uh, you know, competing yeah, in Mr. Yeah. Olympia, they're not living very long. They're getting colon cancer, they're getting stomach cancer, they're destroying their digestive system in the very process, but they look like they the look epitome. amazing yeah. for about five years and then so no. you want to make sure that you're following the principle because, you know, I love this text. I don't mean to come in on and, 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 and quote from the Bible so much, but this is, this is where I get my principles from. And there's this one text that says, know you not that he is God and it is he that made us, right? So if we understand that God made us, we are fearfully and wonderfully made and he knows exactly what to feed us, when to feed us, how much to feed us, right. and all of these things, and they're all found, they're all found in the Bible. Is science confirming any one of these Absolutely. diets to be the very best diet we can have? Absolutely. Again, plant-based is number one, just in terms of longevity. What we're seeing is that there are blue zones. Ever hear of those? Anybody yeah. ever hear of blue zones? 
Okay, let me tell you what blue zones are. Blue zones are five geographically confirmed areas in the world where people live longer than anyone else, and there are five of them. Number one, Icaria, Greece. Then there's Sardinia, Italy, where the, 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 the men are living the longest up in the highlands. Then there's Okinawa, Japan. Women live the longest, right? Uh, then there's uh, 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 Costa Rica, right? And right here in the United States of America is Loma Linda, California. There's a blue zone in California. Right here in the country, in California, Loma Linda, California, Southern California. And what they have found is that these people have the greatest number of, of centenarians, people who are living 100 years old or more. So, but they looked at all these five areas and they said, what are the commonalities? And the commonalities are they eat largely of a plant-based diet. They wow. exercise, not necessarily a gym membership, but they do things naturally like hiking and just doing things that, you know, just keep them active, mm. you know, whatever that is, right? Sometimes we think, oh, I got to get a gym membership. That's fine if you got to do that. But what they have found among these five blue zones is that they just, even if it's like in Italy, needing bread, right? right. Just exercising in that way. They ride bicycles. So they found that the very principles that we find in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 are the same that are within these people groups. So there's this group of people that are following these biblical principles and they are reaping the benefits of it. Guess what? A lot of them don't even know they're following the biblical principles. <laughs> <laughs> they're just following them because they get the benefits of it. Now there are some, there are some certainly in Loma Linda, California, they're following them and they're looking at you know, all of, because I mean, there are laws of health, you know. It's like gravity. You can say, I don't believe in gravity all you want, but jump, go up on a building and try to jump off, gravity's gonna pull you down, that law is gonna work. Hey. So in the same way with health, there are principles and laws of health. You know what? You gotta drink your water. You gotta eat better. You gotta exercise, et cetera, et cetera. Rico, what if someone is listening to this and they're watching this, they said, look, I grew up a different way. I struggle with changing my health behaviors. The idea of, of taking on a, a largely plant-based diet, that seems a little bit repulsive. I don't even like eating greens. What would you say to that person who is struggling to make changes to their diet? We invest in our longevity. Mm. You know, whatever age you are right now, you are making investments right now. Mm -hmm. And the people who are living the longest can look back at a point when they were confronted with the same dilemma, with the same conundrum. How am I going to do this? And then they, they made the hard choice and they did it. It's just like what you're doing in your financial life. Mm. You make the investment, it pays dividends in your retirement. And people who go into their retirement and say, I just can't do it. I don't want to do it. I grew up a certain way. <laughs> they get into their later years and they're like, I wish I had. Right. And we don't want anyone to have that experience. Wow. Rico, I really appreciate this discussion. I know there's so much more to talk about. It's really exciting. Yeah, the topic of health is super exciting. We've been talking with health educator Rico Hill on the principles of health found in the Bible, including support for a plant-based diet. After the break, we'll be continuing the conversation with doctor and nutritionist, Dr. Hannah Kaliova. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to Hope at Night. We've been discussing the topic of health and if the Bible supports a plant-based diet. Our next guest is a medical doctor who has also earned her doctorate in nutrition. She has directed various research studies and published more than a dozen research articles, all centered around the effects of choices we make about food. Please welcome to Hope at Night, Dr. Hannah Kaliova. Thank you, Hannah, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Dr. Kaliova, you're the Director of Clinical Research at the Physicians Committee in Washington, D.C. What exactly is the Physicians Committee? The Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is a nonprofit organization that provides nutrition education and conducts nutrition research. And I head up the research department. We're on the forefront. So if there is no treatment for, let's say, rheumatoid arthritis, 
we're doing a study to test out the power of a plant-based nutrition for a specifically this condition. So you guys are on the front lines, you guys are the cutting edge of research, you guys are examining everything that's coming out to figure out solutions and cures and how to, how to remedy the problems of health. That's exactly right. Wow, how long have you been part of this? Uh, you know, my interest in nutrition really started when I was growing up. Uh, and then my grandma died of breast cancer when she was only 63 years old. Wow. And that was a painful moment for our whole family. I loved my grandma. And I, w I just started asking these questions like, you know, what can we do as the rest of the family to stay healthy, uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen to any one of us? Wow, where did you grow up? And I how did you get over here? Uh, I grew up in the Czech Republic, okay. uh, which is a small country next to Germany. And I grew, when I was growing up, we were still under the rule of Russia. So how did you get interested in the topic of health then? Uh, all of a sudden, you know, the, the nutrition information started uh, entering the, the It started country, flooding in, okay. And I was like, wow, like I wanna learn more. I wanna make sure that our, our family stays healthy and doesn't die prematurely like, like my grandma. And when I was 14 years old, uh, a medical doctor came to our town and had lectures on healthy lifestyle for a few weeks. Uh, it was like a lecture series. I didn't know anything about a healthy lifestyle and I was like, well, I'm interested. I, I wanna learn more. And he was actually explaining all the benefits of plant-based nutrition and uh, also the benefits of intermittent fasting. Immediately uh, during the health lectures, I started putting everything into practice. I was like, the information is not good for you if you're not trying it out, if you're not practicing it. Mm. So I was putting everything into practice so right away. So you begin away. to make immediate changes to your life. That's wow. right. Okay. Uh, you know, I need to say that it was not easy. I was 14 years old and my parents were really against it. They were not, they were like, you cannot do a vegan diet when you're when you're 14. <laughs> you will stop growing. You will have all the health problems. Right, like right. you cannot do this. Uh, and finally they stopped arguing with me and my my mom said, "Okay, do your vegan diet, but you need to cook for yourself." Wow. And she thought, you know, this is going to be over. She got you there, didn't yeah. she? <laughs> but I said, Fine, let's do this. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I started experiencing the health benefits right away. Even though I was healthy, I was fully healthy at the age of 14, I could tell uh, that my uh, brain function was improving. I, I was able to, uh, I, was, I was taking my bike to school and my performance was getting better. I was like, this is, this lifestyle is good. You're I reaping like, the benefits, right? I like how I feel. I, f I felt more energetic and I was like, this is the best. I need to learn more. I need to get in-depth knowledge. So that's, that's when I um, decided to go to medical school. Uh, and I want everyone to learn about this new way of living. Uh, because this has so much power. So what eventually led you to become a Bible-believing Christian? At the end of the health lectures, the local uh, Seventh-day Adventist church offered Bible studies. And I was like, I don't know anything about the Bible. I don't even own a Bible. Right. <laughs> uh, so let me sign up. So I signed up for the Bible studies and we started with the New Testament. And I immediately fell in love with Jesus. I mean, you know, how he was healing the sick, how he had compassion for mm, people, mm. his wisdom. The great the, physician. The depth <laughs> of his teaching. Right. I mean, just incredible. And wow. so at the end of the Bible studies, I was baptized. And, and did you find a lot of things while studying out the Bible with Seventh-day Adventists that were already congruent uh, with a lot of changes you made in regard to your health? Absolutely. Everything made perfect sense. I mean, if we're talking about a creator who created us, why would he not give us an owner's manual? Mm, and right. why would he not <laughs> tell us like what to do and how, how to keep the body mechanism in health, right? Right, awesome. So why are you such a proponent of the plant-based diet? The simple answer is because it works wonders. <laughs> I mean, when you see personally 
how people are just dropping their medications. Like it takes decades to develop diabetes. We're doing a study with people with diabetes right now and people are dropping medications one by one in the first few weeks of wow. being on a plant-based diet. It's just incredible. The same for rheumatoid arthritis. We were doing a study for people with rheumatoid arthritis. You know, these people were suffering with the condition for decades. After a few weeks on a plant-based diet, one lady was not able to tie her, her shoelaces because she had so much pain in her joints and in her fingers. After a few weeks, the swellings went away. She was able to tie her shoelaces. She was crying. She was like, for the first time, I'm able to chop my vegetables in the kitchen. Wow. So you're seeing this sort of uh, amazing rebound of the human body by simply just changing the diet, by putting good things into the body. Uh, exactly there's a, there's right. a, a wonderful rebound that happens, even if you're much older. And I think Rico shared a wonderful story about his mother that did that. But you're also seeing this in the research. Absolutely. It's not only diabetes or whatever condition uh, the, the people joined the study for. Uh, but, you know, they start reporting, oh, I feel so much better on all fronts. My sleep is better. My skin is better. Uh, I feel less less pain. I'm able to, to play more with my grandchildren. I have more energy. Mm -hmm. And so all the aspects of, of life improve. And, and you're finding right? that it's not just longevity that's increasing, but it's also the quality of life because you can live a very long time and be miserable. That's exactly but you're saying right. by by putting by bringing the plant based diet into your your lifestyle, you're just seeing a better quality an overall quality of life. And mm -hmm. it not only for the individual, but, but for the whole families, right. because oftentimes the family members are inspired seeing the changes in their loved one they're like oh let me let me try it also wow. and the whole families adopt a plant-based diet and like yeah what if there's a, a young person who's who's watching this who's listening to this and they're thinking I don't got diabetes I don't got arthritis what benefits uh, w would come to me if I was to, to take on a plant-based diet if you're young and have have ambitious goals to achieve then you need to make sure that your body is in perfect shape mm. uh, so that you can achieve your goals. Now, you were part of the Adventist Health Study. You did research on that. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? What's so amazing about this health study? Uh, Rico mentioned the blue zones and Loma Linda is one of the blue zones where people live the longest and are the healthiest on earth. So I decided to do my postdoctoral fellowship at Loma Linda University. And you know, the Adventist health study is like an amazing tool. The Seventh-day Adventists are pretty health conscious. Uh, most of them they don't smoke, don't drink alcohol, but they differ in their lifestyle habits in terms of some, some people eat meat, some people are vegetarian, they still eat some dairy, some people are complete vegans and eat only a plant-based diet. And now we can look at all these groups and we can look at their health outcomes. And the, the Adventist Health Study showed that there is a linear relationship between the animal product consumption and the body weight. The body mass index as the marker of uh, you know, your healthy body weight being the lowest among vegans. The vegans have the best body weight management compared to other groups that are more liberal with their animal product consumption. So what you're saying is the entire plant-based diet is in a category of its own in regards to health benefits as opposed to even, let's say, just the, the, the lacto-ovo or dairy consumption in vegetarian diets. Yeah, that's exactly right. Wow. Vegans have a lower body mass index, a better weight management compared to even to lacto-ovo vegetarians. They have a lower risk of developing diabetes. And now that's the composition of the diet, what we eat. And the topic of my postdoctoral fellowship is uh, what about when we eat? Does it right. make any difference? Right. So I analyzed the data for more than 50,000 participants in the Adventist Health Study 2. And we looked at the changes in body weight throughout the follow-up of more than seven years. And what we found out was just fascinating. We found a linear relationship between the number of meals we eat per day and how people were gaining weight. So most people eat three meals a day. 
and but let's say uh, you have diabetes or you have weight problems and right. you ask your doctor what you should do the conventional wisdom is well start snacking start start eating small meals during the day so as people were uh, eating four five or six meals a day their risk of uh, gaining weight over time increased compared to people eating just three meals a day. Wow. And now the opposite is also true. There was a large group of people who were eating two meals a day and their weight management was much better compared to three meals a day. So that brings us back, you know, to the ancient uh, wisdom, which has been outlined in the Bible. Uh, and we also looked at the length of night fast and uh, having at least 18 hours between the last meal you eat d in the day and the first meal that you eat, the breakfast that you eat the following day, uh, if you do the math, 18 hours of night fast, that would be two meals eaten five to six hours apart. And uh, the best way to do it is to eat a large breakfast and lunch. We took this approach and we tested it out in a randomized clinical trial in people with type 2 diabetes. Okay. Because this is the group who's been told to eat many small meals during the day the well, most. Let me interject. Why do you need five to six hours in between your meals? Uh, you need to gi give your body enough time to process the first meal and for your blood sugar to come down nicely, for the stomach to empty itself completely uh, and get some rest before you start the second meal. Okay, continue. And we tested out this approach in people with type 2 diabetes. And you could say, well, these people will never be able to do two meals a day, right? Right, right. Uh, and many people, when they were joining the study, they were like, but doc, I don't know if I can do the two meals a day. Like, it, if I'm hungry in the evening, I will just eat. I'm like, okay, let's give it a try. Like, trust me on this, um, you know, let's do this together. And you saw significant changes take and place. it took only three days to adopt the new regimen of two meals a day. Three days? only three days okay. people were not feeling hungry in the evening when when people saw the results at the end of the study they lost more weight it, it was a crossover trial which means that for two we for 12 weeks each participant was doing both of these regimens so one group started with two meals a day and switched over to six meals a day after 12 weeks for another 12 weeks the second group started with six meals a day and then they switched over to the two meals a day. So each single participant tried right. both and they had the direct comparison. And at the end of the study, people were like, I'm doing this for life. This is amazing. <laughs> wow. I mean, I'm spending more, less on groceries, like less meal prep. Uh, that's an added benefit. I lost more weight. My blood sugar is better. Like, why would I even go back? And what's amazing, the hunger feelings decreased more on two meals a day, which oh, is wow. the opposite of what you would expect. Right. You would think if you just shorten the amount of time you're supposed to be eating that food and only two, two meals a day, you're going to be starving. But you're saying no. The research we found is that that's not going to take place. That's exactly right. So you do a lot of these studies and research in Loma Linda. You talked about the blue zone. On average, how long do Seventh-day Adventists live? The difference in lifespan is up to 11 years. So you're telling so, me 11 years they live longer as a result of taking this biblical diet, this biblical lifestyle into their life. That's exactly right. Wow. 11 years of life, a matter of choice. It's not the, denomina the denomination that plays the major role, right? It's right. the lifestyle. Right. So each each one of us can take the lessons from uh, what's, what's working and uh, how we can be better off. Doctor, I've got to ask you this final question. Is God really concerned about our health? Does He really care about our health choices? What a personal question. <laughs> Sometimes we make foolish choices right. and then blame God <laughs> on, you know, on We've the outcomes. Been there, right? <laughs> but if we go back to the principles, back to God, mm. if we really, you know, dig deeper, 
God is so concerned about our health. Mm. He cares so much. He loves us so much. He wants us to prosper in all aspects of life. Right. And health is a big part of it. Yeah, we're not just a soul or, or we're not just a spiritual being. We're a whole being, physical, mental, spiritual, social, emotional. And, and everything we do impacts us. So health is part of that equation. That's exactly right. Rico and Doctor really have enjoyed this conversation. We got some more, so hang on. It's time to go to our break, but when we come back, we'll get to hear some questions from our live audience for our guests tonight, so don't go away. Welcome back to Hope at Night. We've been discussing principles of health supported by both medical science and the Bible. Right now, I'd like to turn to our live in-studio audience for some questions. We got any questions? Right over there. There are a lot of studies that show that it's very harmful for young children especially and developing children in general to not be receiving adequate meat and animal products because there are certain proteins and vitamins in them that are only in them and affect brain development. How can you be condoning veganism for all when children would be missing out on these proteins? What an important question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about the nutrition adequacy of a vegan diet for all of us and specifically for children. Uh, and when we're talking about such an important topic, uh, let me just mention a, an official statement by the uh, Academy of Nutrition uh, which stated that a vegetarian and a vegan diet uh, is nutritionally adequate for all stages in life, including childhood, pregnant women, and breastfeeding and athletes and older, older people. That being said, special uh, attention needs to be paid to nutrition in childhood, especially during the development. Uh, like with any other diet, we need to make sure that the children are getting what, what they need in terms of protein intake, all the micronutrients, but this can be met on a vegan diet. Uh, and we need to pay special attention to this during childhood. Uh, I got a follow up. Uh, how do you find some protein sources in the plant-based diet? First of all, <laughs> uh, we need to eat enough food <laughs> to make, make sure that we eat enough protein. As long as we eat enough calories, uh, we will meet the needs of the, of the protein intake. We made uh, like a special analysis in one of our studies, looking at the protein intake specifically, not only for on quantity, but also the quality on the individual amino acids. And people, all people were exceeding, not only meeting, but exceeding the recommended intake for protein and for all the essential amino acids. This is really essential. Uh, the main sources of protein on a vegan diet are legumes, uh, that's your beans and your peas and lentils. Uh, it's also nuts, nuts and seeds. Uh, and uh, all, the, all the power plate uh, foods, that means fruits and vegetables and grains and legumes, all of them contain some amount of protein. So as long as you eat enough food, <laughs> right. then you will be meeting the, the needs for, uh, for pro protein. Let me just mention um, that there are also uh, some vitamins that are critically important and we may be, uh, on the, to, to err on the safe side, we may be better off supplementing them to make sure that we don't miss out on or are not running too low. And most importantly, that's vitamin B12. Uh, many people are able to make their own in their, in their gut, but we, you know, and, but there's only a small, a small fraction of population who's not able to do it. And uh, just to err on the safe side, you either wanna have your vitamin B12 levels checked uh, periodically, or you just wanna be on a supplement which is super cheap and affordable. You asked a question of what are some of the sources. Um, you know, plants are the only thing on this planet that produces protein, amino acids. It, it basically takes it from the nitrogen and it converts it to amino acids and the cows eat it, anything that's eating, they're getting their protein from a plant source. You won't find any uh, young calf or cows, big bovine animals that are protein deficient because they're getting it directly from a plant-based source. Mm -hmm. We're getting it secondarily from them. 
but the actual source is found in the plants and only plants make it. Wow. That's a fact. And just to add on this, uh, you know, when you look at an elephant or a horse, like these are big creatures and they need to get their protein from plants. Uh, it's just mind blowing. Wow. And, and some of these animals that are on these, these primary plant-based diet tend to have the, the greatest amount of stamina too as well as a result. Yep. Well, let's keep taking some more questions. Any other questions right over there? I'm wondering what are some good ways to get greens in for picky eaters? Very simple. Green smoothies. It's the best way. You get a really nice green smoothie recipe and you grab your kale, you grab your collards, you put in some, you know, some nut-based milk if you can or you can find a ra rice based milk, rice milk is available too, and you just add the things that you like, throw a banana in there, some frozen fruit, and um, you know, and just blend it up and you are none the wiser. It takes just like it tastes just like a milkshake. And it doesn't taste like spinach? It doesn't taste like spinach. <laughs> that's the I'm amazing a fan. thing. <laughs> so that's the fastest, easiest way. And your body is more bioavailable to your body, so your body uses it a lot faster you know, versus chewing and chomping on some collard greens or spinach. You just get it, you sip it, it's delicious, and you move on. So you add spinach, you add banana, you add some nuts. I add a couple of Brazil nuts to mine. I throw a little bit of either peanut butter or almond butter in it. You can use a little avocado in there, a good, you know, healthy fat. Um, and I throw a couple of uh, uh, dates in there, and that'll give it some sweetness along right. with the banana, and it's Fantastic. Amazing. All right, we got time for a few more questions. Right over there. Okay, so most doctors that I have met um, eat like a combination diet, but sometimes you have doctors that support um, plant-based diets and some are that support a carnivore-based diet. Um, and both are, you know, very educated and intellectual mm. and both are, you know, throwing out facts, statistics, evidences, whatever. So who to believe? For me personally, I like to look at the facts and evaluate the science before making any decision. Uh, so uh, when I look at the keto diets that are super popular, the low carbohydrate, high fat diets, uh, from observational studies, we know that people who follow these have a 30% higher risk of dying from any cause at any moment compared with people who are on high carbohydrate diets. The main causes of death are cardiovascular disease and cancer. So that's from observational studies. Uh, let's look at some randomized clinical trials when these kind of diets have been tested uh, and compared one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so at NIH, Dr. Kevin Hall conducted a study where people came to a metabolic ward for a month. And for two weeks, they were on a plant-based diet. And for another two weeks, they were on a keto diet. Uh, he was looking at their body weight and he measured everything, their caloric intake and how much waste. And like, it's a complex study. It's like, you know, NIH level of study. Uh, now, the fascinating point was that people on a keto diet were, were initially losing weight, but all the weight loss was from muscle and water. No fat loss whatsoever. And these were people who were overweight. Mm -hmm. So l how much good does it do for you if you lose muscle? Muscle is like, you know, one of the assets that we need to treasure, especially when we're transitioning to older age. If we're losing muscle as we, as we age, like uh, our quality of life will, will impair dramatically. Uh, so there are studies out there um, that we can use uh, like as a guiding principle. And, and you know, it's really interesting about the, the sort of this ketogenic diet. The principles are, right, it's, it's, it's low carb, high mm -hmm. protein, high fat. When you're restricting carbs, you're robbing yourself of micronutrients that are in fruits that will put you out of ketosis. Right. And, and you can't eat these high carb fruits, but you're, you're robbing yeah. yourself of all those micronutrients, those phytonutrients, yeah. I should say, that are part of these fruits that are there. And Absolutely, it, and that's, that's another aspect. On a keto diet, the official experts recommend supplements because you're not meeting the needs for vitamins and minerals. 
So do you want to be on a diet that doesn't meet your needs for a large host of things such as fiber, <laughs> you know, some, some critical vitamins that you need? Mm -hmm. uh, like we're talking about multivitamin supplements. We're not talking about take a small little vitamin B12 supplement just to be on the safe side, you All know? Right. Do we have any other questions? Right over there. Hi, so if you still wanted to eat meat, what types are healthier um, and what types should you avoid or is it like the same health-wise? Great question. I love that question. Okay, real quick. So the answer there is, again, going back to the biblical principle of eating and how God desires us to eat, basically he has, he has delineated, he has drawn a, a, a very clear line in the sand that there are clean meats and there are unclean meats, right? And as you go through a, um, a certain book in the Bible, it really lays out in just specific details. In, in terms of fish, it needs to have scales. And just think about that, like crabs, and I, I know in certain states, you know, that's, that's a big deal to eat crabs and lobster, and, right? <laughs> but you'll find that they actually will eat anything. They're like, oh, I hate to say it, but they are basically the garbage disposals of the earth. So God delineates and he makes it very clear, don't eat those things because they can make you sick. They're cleaning up the earth and that's how they've been designed. Whereas they're clean animals, those like you know, your, your, your beef, clean beef, you, you know, your chicken, uh, your turkey, those things like that. But let me give you real quick this idea from a principle in the Bible. So when the story of Noah and the flood, right? God said, you're gonna take onto the boat, on that big boat, you're gonna take you're going to take seven of the clean animals and only two of the unclean, right? So they were preserved, but the, the, you know, a lot of people, you see these images of the Noah's Ark and it's just like two by two by two. No, that's not the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's actually two of the unclean, whereas seven of the clean animals. So they were going to use those for sacrifice and he allowed them to eat meat later and they were going to be for that but never for the unclean. And that's any type of the, you know, swine, flesh, any type of birds that eat carrion, any type of fish that don't have scales. So it's very delineated there in, in the scriptures, but that's the principle. So if you're gonna eat meat, you wanna do it clean and not unclean. I like to add that this is completely supported by science because when we look at different kinds of meat, the processed meats and the red meats are the most risky meats that we could eat. Uh, like processed meats, that's the ham and it's the hot dog and that's pork, right? Just cured pork meat. And that's the most risky kind of meat for, for human health, both for the risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes, uh, but also is, it's been classified by the World Health Organization uh, among asbestos. It's like the top high risky me uh, group of meats. On the other hand, the white meats, the chicken and the fish are considered a bit less risky. But let me add, we're, we live at a time when we use so many antibiotics, look at how the chicken live, right? We use so many antibiotics. We, we, there's so much mercury because of the, uh, of the pollution of the earth that accumulates uh, in fish that there are some, some cases of poisoning with mercury. So it's been recommended to limit fish intake to no more than two servings per week uh, for, for the whole population um, because of the mercury levels. And there, there have been some cases where just removing fish from the diet has alleviated a lot of health problems. So let me encourage everyone to just like take it into consideration that even though it's white meat, there's still you know, other problems uh, that are associated with its consumption. Wonderful, any other questions? Right over there. Hi, uh, in Blue Zones, how important is faith according to the studies? Mm -hmm. In Blue Zones talk about their diet, what about faith? Yeah, when they looked at all five, yeah, there were the commonalities of you know, nutrition and exercise and you know, these kind of things, but one is very, that is very specific to our country and to the blue zone that's here in the U.S. is Loma Linda. And they find that uh, part of the reason why they have longevity 
is because they observe one day a week where they rest. They put, a, put away, you know, all of their, you know, secular work and all their type of things that are, have nothing to do with faith and their spirituality, and they focus in on their God, they focus in on their, you know, their spiritual life, and um, this, they have found, it's, it's the equivalent of parking your car one day every week while everyone is driving seven days a week. You, you, that makes sense? So therefore, who's going to have a car that has, you know, that is more intact and can, can last longer at the end of, say, 40 years? Those who actually take that time and actually have sort of a holiday every week. So faith plays a huge role for those in Loma Linda. So it's it's not just diet. It's this this idea of faith. It's not, it's not one silver bullet. Right. It's like a buckshot. It's all these things are working together. Right. That causes, and that's what you find from from the principles in the Bible. It's not just one thing. That's right. It's these things working together in concert. There, there's this idea of 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 the diet. There's this idea of the Sabbath, which the we Sabbath. talked about in a previous oh, episode. Okay. Yeah, it was amazing. This idea of community. Yeah, I'd like to mention that the Blue Zones differ in their cultural practices. You know, Loma Linda is a Seventh-day Adventist Blue Zone. Other Blue Zones have different practices, but all of them have a huge emphasis on community, like being involved and socially engaged is a huge part of all the Blue Zones. Right, right. Yeah. And, and you're bringing these together and it just brings out this sort of optimal way of life, healthy and happy, right? Yep. That's right. right. Awesome. Any other questions? Right over there. It is so expensive to be on a plant-based diet, especially when it comes to like getting vegan meats and fruits and vegetables, depending on your area. Um, so my question is, are there affordable ways to maintain a plant-based diet? Yes, yeah, sure. If you go to a lot of the things that are being produced and marketed, right now in this plant-based kind of era that we're in, you will see that those things are quite expensive. But when you go to the basics, like who doesn't like beans, right? Most people like a good burrito or something like that. Beans are very inexpensive. How about rice? 75% probably of the world eat beans and rice and they're very inexpensive. And then add to that, you know, um, just picking up some fruits and vegetables. I know that there are some places where there are kind of food deserts where you can't get them. However, the ones who live where there's a grocery store almost on every corner and you have access to the, the living foods that are right there in the produce section. And you know, unless you're getting something that's high, high in, not very expensive. <laughs> Learning to buy in bulk, you know, your grains, eating like, you know, your, your oatmeal in the morning. Most places you can get oatmeal and these type of grain cereals, and it's not very expensive, and you can also get it in bulk. So there are ways to do it. And final thing I'll say is, a lot of those things in combination, like for example, a lot of times people are trying to buy these highly produced and processed um, quote unquote fake meats, right? There are lots of them out there right now, but there's, you know, there are some of us, and I happen to be one, where I'll take the oatmeal and I'll take some of these other legume type things or uh, nuts and seeds, and you make your own. There are lots of recipes where you can make your own burgers and you can make them for a month and not spend a lot of money. So there are lots of ways to do it. You just have to tap into this culture that's out there where people are doing it and they're doing it really well and not for a lot of money. Rico, I gotta ask you, yeah. is your freezer full? of these oat burgers you're talking My about? My freezer is <laughs> overflowing. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got time for one more question. Right over there. Hi again. Uh, so I heard you earlier mention the obesity epidemic. And what I wanted to bring up was the problem of the eating disorder epidemic with what you're saying about restricting and that we are dealing with obesity and we need to lower our weights to again. become healthier and we should do intermittent fasting and restrict our diets, how is that not fueling the eating disorder epidemic? What a great question. Uh, eating disorders um, that go back to our image of the body and our culture seems to be promoting a certain type of uh, body image that is not sustainable, fr frankly. A plant-based diet puts some restrictions on the choices, right? Uh, but so does any diet where you need to lose some weight. 
the main question is, is the person really in need of losing weight or is it only in their mind? Um, and uh, sometimes professional help is needed in, in order to overcome the, the false body image and uh, you know, be happy with uh, where I am, be grateful and move forward in, in gratitude in, instead of like self-blame and um, like self-destructive behavior. Right, and, and when we're ta as we're talking about diet, as we talked about the Bible and we looked at evidence, mm -hmm. the diet doesn't just impact us you know, in regards to our longevity or weight, uh, but there's something that happens in the mind, right? There's a clarity that takes place Absolutely. too, right? And that clarity is really important. Look, you can lose your arm and you can still have a relationship with Jesus. Right? <laughs> you can lose your leg, you can still have a relationship with Jesus, and there are people like that. You can yeah. lose your, your fingers and still have a relationship mm. with Jesus, but you lose your mind, mm. you're in trouble, right? Mm, and there's something point. that the Bible points out that even the foods that we eat impact our ability to think and process. Not that God, uh, uh, you know, says, hey, food is meritorious. Uh, food makes me love you more or love you less. That's not it. But when it comes to what we eat, it impacts just, just the way we think and process. Mm -hmm. Uh, like you were pointing out when you were younger, you begin to experience some clarity. Rico, mm -hmm. you have any yeah, thoughts on that? When we eat a certain way, we find we can, I mean, there's, there are some things that will show that we could be more aggressive with, in our behaviors, you know? Or when we don't eat it, at all. <laughs> I get hangry all hangry. the time. Yeah, right, right. So it, it plays a big part <laughs> on just in how we, how we relate to one another. But certainly to your point, it, it is, is so important how we relate to God because when we find that we relate to God in a way that's, that's healthy, then we begin to see ourselves differently as He sees us and you're enough. You know, and in and, and, and this body image kind of issue, the, the perception is that you're not enough or you're, you don't look right or whatever, but God takes us right as we are. Right. And he says, you're enough. That's right. You're right. beautiful just as you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And I, what I'm hearing so much from this is, hey, look, there, there's a responsibility every person has, up, has upon their own body, their own mind, stewardship of the body that God gives to us. That's right. And, and God wants us to take, you know, all the evidence and, and research and, and what the scriptures are saying and make the best possible decisions. I really appreciated this discussion. It's been fantastic. I know we can keep talking about this subject. But I hope this conversation has given you a change of heart, both physically and metaphorically, or at least given you some food for thought. Jesus says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. God desires us to be healthy and happy, and I'm glad he uses science and the Bible to teach us how to get there. If you've been inspired to follow a more healthful lifestyle, follow us on our Facebook page at Hope at Night and share your thoughts with us there. To catch previous episodes of Hope at Night, please visit our website at hopetv.org slash hopeatnight. Thanks again for joining us today. We'll see you next time. <laughs>